Hello everybody. This is a podcast created for Literature Shorts, a program run by Dr. Nikhilesh Bhattacharya, Assistant Professor at the Birbara College Department of English, affiliated to the University of North Bengal, India. Now, I'm the speaker for this episode of this podcast series and I'm Dr. S.D. Choudhury, Assistant Professor at the Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology, Bhuvaneshwar, India. So I must begin by thanking Dr. Bhattacharya for running such an innovative program. And though this is primarily aimed at the BA English students of Birpara College, anyone else who listens to this sort of thing for fun is most welcome. So today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite texts in English literature, Beowulf. Now, when I say Beowulf is one of my favorite texts, students and teachers alike say, oh, Beowulf, it's so difficult, it's so boring. Why do you like it so much? Well, uh, let me give you two simple reasons. One, I like monster stories. I like mythology and fantasy. And two, I had a very, very good teacher who showed me exactly where the interesting bits of a difficult text lay. So today I'll be talking about um, some aspects associated with the monster antagonist known as Grendel in Beowulf. And I'll go on to talk a little about some other monsters maybe, if time permits. So I hope I'll be able to make this enjoyable for you as well. So Beowulf, composed um, between 685 to 725 AD uh, by an anonymous composer, is an Anglo-Saxon epic poem that recounts three exploits of the Giatish hero Beowulf told in an episodic fashion. Now mark that, it's in episodes, so there is no cause and effect kind of plot in there. It goes like this. The Danish king, Hrothgar, has built a mead hall named Heorot, in which his thanes and kinsmen gather for merrymaking and celebrations. The sound of these celebrations irritates a marsh-dwelling monster called Grendel, who raids the hall and kills and eats some of the thanes. Now this behavior goes on for 12 years. Hrothgar's thanes try to fight and kill the monster, but all of them fail. At the end of 12 years, the Giatish hero Beowulf arrives from over the sea and offers to fight the monster. He fights unarmed against Grendel and tears off one of the monster's arms. Grendel escapes to his underwater cave and dies. The next night, Grendel's mother turns up at Herot and kills one of Hrothgar's most cherished thanes. Beowulf tracks the mother to her lair underwater in the marshes and kills her. After this, he is lauded by King Hrothgar and sails back to his own country where he later becomes king. After many long and peaceful years of reign, his kingdom is attacked by a dragon and Beowulf goes to fight it. Now this proves to be his last battle for the dragon's bite kills him even as he manages to kill the dragon. The poem ends with an account of Beowulf's funeral. Now that the monster is an outsider in any culture is a long and traditionally accepted trope. The monster is not usually human. It comes from outside the human society and disrupts it so that it must be destroyed. Uh, it must be destroyed so that society can, human society can continue to function as before. Now let's see how the epic describes Grendel. Grendel is everything an honorable Anglo-Saxon warrior should not be. He is mostly described in negatives. He has no physical description in the epic, no face, because no one bothers to describe what he looks like. Even Grendel's name probably etymologically associated with ground or grinding, doesn't seem to be a specific Old English word or have a meaning in that language. Perhaps heroic philosophy doesn't 
see the need to put a proper name to um, to an antagonist that is designated as an evil monster. Though Grendel is important enough, at least in the eyes of the author of Beowulf, to merit a name, yet it remains a meaningless name, like the ones invented for uh, bugaboos intended to scare children. What he represents is more important, and what he does is exactly the opposite of the Norse heroic ideal. Grendel kills, but not face to face, not in broad daylight, not with weapons. All three very important points. He has a lineage, but it's not the accepted patrilineal type. You never hear of Grendel's father, all right? only his mother. Now he has been given the very properly improper genealogy of belonging to the race of Cain by the, by the vaguely Christianizing narrative filter, but it's his mother the text talks about. Now keeping this textual information in our minds, let's revisit J.R.R. Tolkien and his now famous 1936 Sir Israel Gollan's memorial lecture to the British Academy. A well-respected Anglo-Saxon and Beowulf scholar, Tolkien defended the poem in such a way that the course of all subsequent Beowulf scholarship changed. Till then, critics generally cited the consensus that the poem had value as a historical document only. Critics said that its construction was poor, and the themes were closer to a child's fairy tale than an epic proper. Tolkien defended the poem as a literary piece, asserting that the poem's construction was not poor, but poorly recognized. The structure didn't intend to trace a straightforward biography of Beowulf. It simply put two halves of an adventure in balance. Youth and old age, success and failure, as symbolized by the ventures against the troll, that is Grendel, and the dragon, the unnamed dragon. Tolkien defended the dragon in particular, saying that it stood against all the values and bonds that the poem advocated. It would seem that Grendel too is featured in much the same way. In Beowulf, Grendel is called by many names, each having a specific import. He is referred to as Sir Elengast, the bold demon, Landbuend, the cave dweller, and Sir Grimmagast Grendel Harten, that is, the grim or cruel spirit called Grendel. But he is also called the miserable man. See the contrast? Monster, man, demon, man. Is called the Mearkstapa, that is, the border wanderer. Fifelkin, that is, monster race. But also, Wonsali Ware, the unhappy man. Mark the contrast again. Again, in line 120 onwards in the poem, Grendel is described like this. One shaft wearer wicked on halo, grim on the gradig, reok on the rethe. So this means that he is a creature of damnation, grim and greedy, fierce and cruel, but still an unhappy man, one shaft wearer. He is the feorch ebalo, deadly evil, deat skua, death shadow, and feond mankinness, the enemy of mankind. Perhaps his most damning epithet stems from a description of his moral iniquity, like goddess on Sakan, God's adversary. But the word used most often to refer to Grendel is the simplest as well as the most ambiguous word. He is simply called Sa Aglaka, that is, the terrible one. Now, as you can understand, this is a morally neutral description. This is not particularly evil, particularly good, morally neutral. And it is also sometimes used for heroes. But Grendel is not seen as neutral. He is portrayed as a foe of mankind and the adversary of God, almost at the level of Satan. Definitely evil. As it can be seen in the text, lines um, 86 to 90, clearly describe Grendel's motivation for raiding Hrothgar's hall. When he hears the poet in the hall praising God's act of creation, 
Grendel suffers. Now it's surprising that a creature uh, depicted primarily as animalistic and living in a swamp should be upset with something that's not even his own business, unless it's the decibel level that bothers him. Tacitus, or Tacitus, whichever way you choose to pronounce it, Tacitus records the Germanic people as war-loving, almost always carrying weapons, and spending little time on constructive work like building or farming. Their morals and codes of loyalty were very strict. So such a people would obviously hold this code of loyalty to be higher than everything, even authority, all authority. They ruled themselves with the kings they chose for themselves. So bonds of loyalty were mainly of two kinds, familial loyalty and loyalty to the overlord or king. This latter formed the central idea of early Germanic society. A war leader could have a band of warriors who would be loyal to him to their deaths. Now such loyalty did not come free though. The thanes served their overlord and were given gifts as reward. The higher they rose in the hierarchy, the more loyalty they owed and the gifts became richer. For the thanes who were related to the king, this loyalty became doubly binding as their gratitude and loyalty were intensified by their um, ties of kinship. Now these concepts probably led to a cultural fascination with betrayal of allegiance and violation of kinship for the most Tragic stories in the Germanic culture involve such acts. The tale of Siegfried would be a common example. The main narrative of Beowulf, however, deals with this theme only obliquely. Kin slaughter, the ultimate betrayal of blood loyalty, held a singular interest for the Germanic people. The Anglo-Saxons in the British Isles, whether newly converted to Christianity or still adhering to the old gods, must have felt a keen interest in the story of Cain, his crime and banishment. They might have wondered why the feud ended with Cain, because in the Germanic tradition the sons or the brothers of the dead man had the right to carry out revenge. Abel had no son, according to the Bible, but Adam's third son was called Set. Now to Germanic minds, Set would have a perfectly legitimate reason as well as the duty of continuing this blood feud. This figure of Cain is seen by the Beowulf poet as locked in perpetual struggle with man and God. As Noah was descended from Set, and all men are descended from Noah after the flood, it would make all men descendants of Set. Now that would be reason enough for any descendant of Cain to bear an eternal grudge against humankind from the German Germanic point of view. Also, due to Cain's evil deeds, his descendants became monsters and giants. Now all these traditions provided a most suitable frame to fit Grendel neatly into. Moreover, Cain was an outlaw and therefore all his descendants could also be regarded as outlaws. Outside the law and, his, and its protection, an outlaw could be killed morally and legally and his family prevented from taking vengeance. According to the uh, Lex Salica, this killing could be classified as a needful killing like the extermination of vermin. Uh, if you are wondering what the Lex Salica is, it's it was a major body of Frankish law governing Franks of Francia in the early Middle Ages. Uh, the laws were maintained in written form in Latin and codified both civil and criminal law. So Grendel, living outside human settlement and displeased with human society, can be justifiably classified as an outlaw. In the poem, the lines 154 and 55 tell us that Grendel wanted no peace with any Dane and lines 156 to 58 also remind us that he never gave any compensation for these wrongful deaths. If we go back a little to the lines 135 to 137, we would see that Grendel did not mourn over the destruction he caused. And most importantly, Grendel is described as a 
lone walker that is he is not part of a comitatus bond now what is a comitatus bond this is important the loyalty that we were talking about a little while ago that's part of this as tacitus describes comitatus this was the bond between a germanic warrior and his overlord this is a structure of loyalty and fidelity uh, in return for arms land and or a share in plunder usually called gifts now this mutual fidelity ensured that neither left the battlefield before the other person now as tacitus says that to survive the leader and to retreat from the battlefield was a lifelong disgrace and infamy for any warrior any thane the warriors were called thanes here so grendel is not part of a comitatus bond and grendel uh, for this reason cannot ask for nor accept the vere guild which was so important to the anglo-saxon society now this is a new word again what is vere guild vere guild literally means man gold where man guild gold this was an important legal mechanism in early germanic society um partly associated with the other common form of uh, legal reparation that is blood revenge where a guild was actually a value placed on every human being and every piece of property in the salic code or the lex salica injury or killing of a person as well as damage or stealth of property would be repairable by payment of this value as a restitution to the victim's family or to the owner of the property so since grendel is a lone walker he is not part of comitatus therefore he cannot accept or ask for where guild and since he cannot do any of these things any of these above mentioned acts he cannot also be part of a flichting flichting may be considered as the most significant part of the entire act of being an anglo-saxon hero or a warrior it is basically boasting of one's own heroic deeds it's a verbal battle but more than the actual heroic actions which may not have happened in public it is the public flichting that establishes the identity of the hero uh, like i said it's a verbal battle it's a very solipsistic speech device but it does set up a warrior's personal identity as well as his appropriate social identity as a true warrior now all these points raised are not normative but divine practices in the germanic society and uh, that's how they render grendel not only as an outlaw but also as an outsider grendel is continuously referred to as werga accursed werghdo damned heoro werg accursed outcast grundwirgenne accursed creature of the depth brimwulf lake wolf so you can see that all the words here refer to not just the wolf as a beast but to the phenomenon of being cursed or damned with the state of being a beast this extended reference may not be to the lupine nature of a man or or even to the to the legend of the werewolf the first four words werga werghdo heoro werg and grundwirgenne these four words have as part of their root the word warg old germanic for outlaw a warg would have been outlawed from the regular society for unforgivable or unredeemable crimes they would be cast out from their communities to to wander until they die and they could be legitimately killed as a wolf or a beast grendel's mode of attack is also alien and disgusting to germanic sensibilities like a like a primitive beast or like an icelandic revenant grendel comes at night works by stealth and eats actually eats the flesh of his victims and drinks their blood often uh, on the spot the first accusation here would be that of cowardice the victims were always sleeping and none of them could fight back secondly he ate his victims which denied them both the 
the dignity of a death in battle as well as the chance of a proper um, ritual burial. Thirdly, he drank blood, which the, uh, the newly initiated Germanic, the newly Christianized Germanic people knew to be forbidden as according to Acts 15.29. Acts 15.29 says, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well fare ye well so it's interesting to speculate what the germanic people would have thought of grendel's mother coming to exact revenge on her son's death her blood loyalty would permit her to avenge her son but her status as an outlaw and monster would render such attempt at revenge quite illegal. So, in a way, the killing of Grendel is a legal execution. Within the Christian church tradition, evil, when depicted as abstractions of a religious nature, usually takes a grotesque form in literature and artistic descriptions. A common example would be the portrayals of the seven deadly sins which are given um, deliberately repulsive forms so you know so that lechery looks like a goat sloth is droop-eyed gluttony is pale and bilious looking etc this intentional repulsiveness tends to push them outside the margins of the society and also equates them with the margins of human society where the approved behavioral patterns end just to make a comparison architectural monsters like gargoyles were always placed outside the cathedrals on the walls that is just outside the boundary of the sanctuary signifying their uh, association with the dangerous world outside the shelter of the church for for similar reasons monsters decorated the margins of illuminated manuscripts so it's highly probable that Grendel too is meant more for contemplation than function like the uh, personifications of evil that I've just mentioned the epithets uh, used in this context like water wolf and border wanderer actually point to such a possibility as well as um, the the origins mentioned before so Grendel is you might say Grendel is made out to be more of a monstrosity than uh, he is born a monster. Later, as there came to be certain differences between the two European Bible translations, the Cain tradition actually developed in different directions in medieval times. While the Greek Septuagint tells of the angels of God mating with the daughters of men, and one wonders were they the daughters of Cain, thus creating gigantic and monstrous figures. The Latin Vulgate mentions the giants, but not their origin. In the Roman Catholic tradition, the offspring of Cain were seen as evil, yes, but gigantic only in deeds, not in their physical size. But in some instances uh, where the giants were still seen as real giants, they were explained by the invention that Cain was the son of Eve and the serpent, that is Satan, so not of Adam. The other minor tradition concerning Cain and Abel comes from an apocryphal book called the Book of Adam and Eve, which tells of Eve having a dream in which Cain drinks his brother's blood. So in an attempt to prevent this prophecy from happening, or this dream from happening, the two young men are separated and given different tasks. So part of the idea of the monster perhaps uh, stems from the Western cultural assumption that the whole of uh, world events in, is based on bitter struggles. However, the survival of the fittest is of course not the same as kill or be killed. From the latter point of view, uh, which prevents connection and empathy between creatures, the world automatically becomes an enemy. So, one might say that what comes between the monsters and the humans is actually the attitude of the humans. As an aside, it might be noted that uh, this is the basis of most creature movies, most monster movies. 
In patristic sources, Abel always wonders. He is the quester and the pilgrim. It's actually Cain who founds a city and urbanity. In the, um, in the Corpus Christi cycle of plays, Cain is often represented as a tax dodger. So in many ways, Cain is exactly um, the opposite of Beowulf. He may have founded the city, but he or his descendant is certainly not a citizen. The word monster comes from the Latin word monstrare, to show. The image of the monster um, demonstrates, so monstra, the same root, demonstrates to us the limit and uh, predictably instructs us not to cross it. As such, a monster is predictable. It may be called a somewhat um, hybrid creature, usually represented as a combination of human and animal, you know, uh, often humanoid in shape, but animalistic by nature, that kind of thing. So it's an amalgamation of natural elements, but what renders its combination unnatural is its context. Now, when I say humanoid, I mean that any aspect of humanity and human behavior that can be uh, distorted to produce an effect considered um, eerie or unnatural or inhuman. It may range from a way of moving, a way of talking, uh, one part of the body that appears different, uh, the origin of the creature, its size, its habit, its habitat, and especially its diet. The quintessential monster uh, of the human imagination is certainly not herbivorous. Monsters are generally carnivorous and uh, many of them are specially addicted to human flesh. It's strange that the, the fear of a, of a normal carnivorous animal, say a tiger, though great, doesn't quite affect us the same way as the idea of a werewolf. A part of this terrible fear comes from the possibility of um, contamination and eventual transformation from the bite of the monster and a part, I would argue, from the idea that the monsters are in some part human, that is from the horror and disgust of cannibalism. The fear of the monster also comes from the the primal fear of teeth, of being eaten physically and also inwardly as the soul gets consumed. Apparently it's, it's um, equally scary whether the skeleton remains or the outer flesh. Perhaps more so in the latter case because it seems to consume the identity of the victim, leaving only a shell or a husk behind. So this is the concept of uh, the zombie and the golem. Um, and this is the idea adapted by J.K. Rowling in Harry Potter series in the, in the soul-sucking kiss of the Dementor. If you know of the Arabian monster called the ghoul, uh, which is a kind of a living creature, it's also depicted as eating the flesh of the dead. So the zombie is an opposite of a human being. It's not living, it is not sentient, it is not conscious, and it is not capable of self-questioning. All monsters, all monsters that the human imagination has invented are all or some of these non-living, non-sentient, non-conscious and incapable of self-questioning. A zombie lacks the experience of the events that scientists call qualia, that is the conscious experiences that are separate from physical processes. Right, the experiences that make up our identity ultimately become a part of our identity. So a zombie has no sense of self. Now this is a defining characteristic that's often confused in literature and especially in uh, movies. But it's more fundamental to the zombie myth than death. As it's quite possible to have a zombie that's not actually dead. Moreover, it's not possible to create a zombie with a sense of identity because that is, by its very definition, self-contradictory. Now, this uh, theory is a corollary of the hypothesis that death is the end of all sense of individual identity. Uh, the other category, vampires, they represent our fears of degeneration into primitivism. It's a fact to be taken note of that the vampire hunters depicted in literature 
and uh, on screen in general represent a civilization. They represent a definitive social order. Vampires, on the other hand, represent chaos and a disruption of the social order. Where the hunters embody modernity, the vampires embody superstition. Think of Count Dracula, depicted by Bram Stoker as having a very animalistic appearance with pointed ears and hairy hands and so on. If I take this to represent an evolutionary throwback, then the defeat of Dracula explicitly stands for the victory of modern science and civilization. And yet, the idea of the vampire illustrates how, how fragile and prone to collapsing the so-called modern civilization is, and how likely it is to fall under the, the seductive spell of the primitive and the barbaric. Also, the unique bipolarity of the vampire is that it's both alive and dead, both human and supernatural. So such characteristics often force us to reconsider the, the nature and the significance of the individual. So it seems that the threat of the monster is actually the threat of the primitive, the, the primordial, and the encroaching beast against the beauty of the civilized and the human. It's an evolution in reverse, going back to bestial elements, um, regardless of the human being's status, race or nationality. And yet, when the monster is conquered, it's conquered by deliberately permitting the civilized man to, to revert to the level of the monster's brute force. Most of the times, the monster cannot be vanquished nor won over with civilization or with refinement or with intellectuality. If you watch the movie Beowulf, which came out in 2007, uh, directed by Robert Zemeckis, you will find that this principle is illustrated there quite forcefully, because in that movie, Beowulf discards all signs of civilization when he encounters Grendel and fights Grendel naked. So... The monster is itself a topos, a, a space which lets society adopt perspectives about the permissible and the impermissible. In all likelihood, the relationship with the monster is a relationship of the dialectic. You cannot call the postmodern interpretation of a monster just a myth or a metaphor. You, you might like to think of, his, of it as an attempt at explaining the features of a world we are not in general comfortable living in, so that anything that poses as a threat or a menace to the human form or to the human status as supreme, you know, is dubbed monstrous by the human mind. And this is how the ideal of civilization and both social and individual identity are disrupted by the idea of the monster again and again. So in this particular case, this unholy interference is both spatial, since Grendel passes into Herod, and temporal too, since Grendel embodies a, a non-modern form of knowledge that has the power to interrupt social advancement and perhaps even evolution. I think I should stop here for now because the time uh, limit is up. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.